to save me. There's still one in the Harper Asbury Wildlife Rescue Center, and it's in it. The other thing is, um, it's a little more complicated, but the government, in the shape of DEFRA, you all know who DEFRA are, the Department of the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Well, to, to cut a long story short, basically we have people who are in charge of our countryside who are farmers, and there isn't any balance in there. And farming really is kind of an opposite end of the scale. If you want to farm animals, basically anything that moves on your your ranch that isn't a tractor is not desirable. Um, so badgers have been blamed for the fact that bovine TB has spread throughout the country. It's actually very unfair because there wouldn't be any bovine TB in this country if it weren't for cows. So we have a problem that, that cows have infected our badger population, but the government is very much influenced by the farmers who help to put them into office and they feel obliged to use the, the badger as a scapegoat. And they've done something rather disgraceful in my mind, because you know, I'm a scientist, and I have a lot of faith in science at its best. Um, but science always starts from the point of view of neutrality. If you're going to write a paper about something, you investigate it from all points of view, and you eliminate bias from your thinking. Now, the DEFRA have done exactly the opposite. They've gone around shouting that they're going to cull the badgers, I mean, Jim Pace has been doing this since before he was elected. We're going to cull the badgers. So what they've done is they've got some scientists to get together and construct a scientific paper to prove their point. The paper is on the DEFRA website, and if you go there, you'll get a whole flood of information which looks like a scientific paper, but I have to tell you it's not. It's a means of supporting one side of a view, and it's a side which is actually unsupportable by science. There's been a lot of research done on the way that badgers influence bovine TB. And in fact, there was a 10-year study done by some people called the ISG, the Independent Scientific Group, from Imperial College, where I come from. And this was a 10-year study which took millions of pounds in which they killed 11,000 badgers. And the conclusion that these independent and unbiased <coughs> scientists came to was, in their own words, culling badgers cannot meaningfully contribute to the control of bovine TB in the UK. Uh, again, I'll cut a long story short. It, people tried to attack it, but they attacked it from the point of view of farmers who still, in spite of all the science, looked at a badger and thought, oh, there's the enemy, he's infecting my cows. Uh, and if you look at the history of the way bovine TB has moved, it's moved from here down in the West Country, and a sudden outbreak out here, a sudden outbreak out here. Now, badgers don't walk that fast. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it's a complex subject. But what I would like you to do, and it takes a few minutes of your time, but not that many minutes, um, you can go to the DEFRA website, but it will be heavy going. By all means, please do it and see what they say. But what I'd like you to do is to go either to our site, uh, save me, save-me.org.uk, uh, where you will find, you'll find a set of instructions which will make it easy for you to respond to the consultation. What we would like is an overwhelming number of people to respond against uh, the proposed cull. They're proposing to cull badges in the hotspots. They want to, well, what they're proposing to do is to kill 80% of badges in the hotspots of bovine TV. And they propose to do it by a mixture of trapping badges and shooting them, and by licensing farmers to go out and take pot shots at them in the dark. And of course, this, this is shot with problems. It, it's, it's the most ridiculous <coughs> plan you could come up with, really, because if you start shooting badges, the rest of them are going to scatter to the winds and to the, to the guy next door. Um, and if they are infected with bovine TB, they'll be spreading it even more. And it's a well-known fact that if you disturb badges, then, and, and you kill them in a certain area, the incidence of bovine TB in the surrounding areas will increase. Um, well, they're calling it a science-based cull, but you can all laugh with me, okay? This is not a science-based cull, this is something which is being done against all reason. So please, um, visit us at Save Me, or visit the Badger Trust website, and um, make your opinions felt, if you feel strongly that we, we ought to be protecting our wild animals and not killing them to solve a problem which we can't solve in other ways. 
So that's it really. There are plenty of other things. You know, we all know there are so many animal abuses going on and nobody can cover them all. But by chipping away in our areas, we can make a difference. I really think that we can make a difference. And that, that wind of change is something which is growing. And I think we need to be a little bit evangelical. We have to actually get out there and talk about it to everyone. Um, I also think there's a line we, which we travel along. You know, when I was a kid, I, I didn't like eating lamb. It made me sick, you know, and I told my parents I didn't want to. But I found other things okay. You know, I would eat beef and whatever. And, and I remember asking my mum, saying, you know, is this, is this, this is supposed to be cow? You know, is this the same kind of cow as we see in the fields? And she went, well, yeah, you know, <laughs> exactly. And then, you know, the, the lamb, you know, the, it's called lamb. You know, so it's a, this is called lamb. You know, it's a sort of big piece of stuff. It's not the same as these little fluffy creatures. And she went, well. <laughs> and so I gradually became aware. But it's funny, I, I, I think about this a lot. So much of it is conditioning. We grow up with the, the values of our parents, and it's very hard to get away from those, even, we, even though we're very logical creatures. Um, so, in a, in a way, I, I can understand why these people who want to hunt animals are kind of wedded to the idea, because perhaps the, the best experiences they ever had with their dad was going out on a winter morning and trying to kill a fox. Uh, maybe that's the only time they ever saw their dad. Um, so, it's something we all have to struggle with, and I think we, we walk this line, and over here is, let's kill everything and it doesn't matter, and over here is complete, utter veganism. <laughs> And, um, and I've been going along this line, and, and to be honest, I thought vegans were cranks until a couple of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought it, <laughs> I thought, come on, you know, you know, the milk isn't hurting the animal, you know, the eggs aren't hurting the chickens. And then you find out how they do it, and you start wondering, oh, what happens to all the, the male chickens? What happens to all the, the male cows? You know, you don't see many bulls around the place. Oh, that's what they do, is it? You know, and how do they keep the the cow perpetually in, in milk, well, because they take the babies away from them as soon as they're born, and it's, it's all brutal, really. So I, I only recently stopped the milk, and I said, nicely. <laughs> I said it to my milkman very nice. I said, you've been a good pal to me, but, um, <laughs> but for the time being, it's over. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, we just do our bit, and, and if you get too preachy, you turn people off, of course. You know, you've got to go carefully, and you've got to understand that some people who do things that we don't like are very valuable to us. You know, even in the extremes, I mean, I know some people who go out and shoot birds, and I don't like that. I think that's an awful thing to be doing, but some of those people are very much against fox hunting. So you've got to kind of... Well, you know, the, again, it's a line, but they see the line in a slightly different way. So you've got to be a little bit open-minded, I think, and, and deal with everybody, um, bearing in mind whereabouts on the line they are. They might be good people, and they might be heading towards that way very fast. Um, so maybe we can help them. So I'm going to leave it there. I think man's a wild animal, and pretty pretty shitty wild animal, but we'll do the best we can. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, the deadline for the response to the death row consultation is the seventh. <coughs> well, they they're going to do this up. I would say the seventh because don't leave it till the eighth. So it's this this Friday. So I think yeah, about Tuesday. This Wednesday. Sorry. Wednesday's the eighth. Oh, okay. We'll do it by Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, do it, do it quick. Yeah. It's very clear that the, the farming community is very worried um, because if you look at the Farmers Weekly, as I do, love the Farmers Weekly, um, they're panicking and they're saying that the, the consultation so far has turned up many more people who are against the cult than are for it. Uh, which is great, um, and they also, they actually admitted that the, the arguments are very well reasoned, but then you ask the question, how did they get this information? 
why don't we have that information? How are they able to go into the, the government impartial consultation and get this information and use it in their campaign? Well, I'm sorry, it's corruption. You know, it shows absolutely <coughs> that DEFRA is in cahoots with the farming community, which is a pretty serious accusation, but I'm afraid it's inescapable from what we see in place. This year, the foxes have been really demonised in the press. Do you think it's the Countryside Alliance behind it? Yeah. I don't think the Countryside Alliance engineered that story about the foxes biting the babies, no. Yeah, I, but I think they capitalised on it very, very successfully. Um, it's funny, whatever turns up every day will feed either side. Well, you know, the fact that that wonderful, beautiful stag was killed on Dartmoor actually was a terrible thing. But it was, a, in a sense, a windfall for, for our side because it did really wake people up to the idea that this is going on the whole time. And animals are just shot the whole time. And that's, even, that's the good part. Um, so I think the Countryside Alliance are very clever. And they're very rich and very powerful. And they're able to manipulate the media. They certainly have a, a, a very strong influence in a lot of the newspapers and in some of the other media too. Um, but I, I would say, I don't think that they go as far as falsifying evidence. Yeah, um, you talked in the beginning of your presentation about just relying upon our instincts um, to govern our behaviour. I wonder what implications you thought that had for our campaigning work, whether we're trying to take it to vegetarian or to be into <coughs> animal and animal welfare or things. If we're driven by our sort of instincts, then should we be using lots of reasoned arguments and scientific data when we're trying to persuade people to change their behaviour? Mm, it's a good question. I wasn't really advocating thinking instinctively. I was just saying that that is what happens in many cases. We're, we're very capable of logical thought, though, and that can lead us to good actions. Um, see, my first instinct in dealing with all this is to say to people, this is morally wrong. What's the matter with you guys? Why do you want to hurt an animal? You know, but unfortunately, you have to argue um, in other ways, you have to get into the science because that's the only thing that people will, will want to listen. And you have to get into the money side. The only way to, to get people to protect animals is to persuade them that it's going to do them some good in many cases, which means that they make money out of it. And this happens in Africa. You know, you, if you want to get people to protect the wildlife, you, you make sure that they can make something out of it, as opposed to selling, um, as, as opposed to helping the poachers and making money for them. They make money out of tourism. They make money out of of protecting the animals and allowing people to photograph them. So there's a lot of psychology involved, and I think you have to work at all the different levels, try and make people who otherwise wouldn't be sympathetic <coughs> on your side. So, well, there are people working very hard to, to make drugs and do the research in ways that don't involve those animals. Um, so, uh, one of the things we have to do is support them. Yeah, I don't know about those pills, but I know there are a lot of pills which are based on animal photos. But I hope that people are working on that. They can't. Yeah, yeah. Well, as I say, you know, I think if you look at your life in under a microscope, you're going to find something which doesn't tie up. You know, it's walking along this line again. You know, I mean, I would say keep taking your pills, but look for ways. You know, maybe that can become your thing. You you find a way of making the pills animal friendly, if you like. You know, and then. And the fact that you've taken a few of the pills is, is, is vastly outweighed by the fact that you've campaigned and, and changed things for the future. Within less than half a decade, there will be so many animal friendly medications. Certainly hope so. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, good for you, sir.